Did you know that your skin, nails, even your breath could be revealing hidden clues about the health of your liver? Liver disease is far more common than most people realize. I see it every single day in the hospital, and often I can spot signs of liver disease the moment that I walk into a patient's room. So today I'm going to show you the top 12 signs of liver disease so you know what to look out for. Take a look at your fingernails. They are constantly growing through a complicated energy intensive process, and as a result, changes in your health often show up in your nails, and liver disease is no exception. See these horizontal white lines running across the nail? These are Muerck lines. These lines are actually on the tissue underneath the nail, not on the nail itself. And if you apply pressure to the nail, they'll temporarily disappear. Of course, since the lines are underneath the nail, as your nail grows, the line will stay in the same place. It won't grow out. Here's another nail finding called Terry's nails. Look how strikingly pale the nails are. Normally, your nails have a pinkish color because of the tiny blood vessels that are in the tissue underneath your nail. But in liver disease, there are changes to that tissue which makes it difficult to see the tiny blood vessels, and that's why the nails are so pale. If you think that your nails look pale and you're wondering if you have Terry's nails, then check for the lunula, which is this half moon at the base of the nail. Having a lunula is normal, so if you can see it, it's probably not Terry's nail. So both of these nail findings, Muerck's lines and Terry's nails, are both linked to low levels of albumin. Albumin is an important protein produced by the liver, and it's often quite low in the setting of liver disease. Next, I've got another test for you to try on yourself. If you love this kind of information and want your questions answered in a monthly live stream, then click the link up here to become a channel member. Put your nails together like this. Can you see a diamond shaped gap between the bases of your nails? If you can, that's normal. But if you can't, and your nails look like this, it's called clubbing. And clubbing is caused by the proliferation of connective tissue between the nail and the finger bone, which makes it thicker than normal. While it can be genetic, if I see clubbing of the nails, I'm hunting for issues with the heart, lungs, or liver. I want you to take a look at this woman's belly. Your first thought might be that she's pregnant, but this is actually a very distended abdomen filled with fluid. This is called ascites. Shockingly, the abdomen can stretch and fill with upwards of 15 liters of fluid. So where exactly does this fluid come from? To understand this, you need to know about the portal vein. Basically, when you eat something, your small bowel absorbs what it can into your bloodstream, and all the blood from your digestive tract gets rooted through the liver to protect your body from any dangerous substances that may have been absorbed through your intestines. The trouble is, as liver disease progresses, the liver becomes scarred and stiff, and that scar tissue starts to block the blood vessels going through the liver, making it harder for blood to flow through the portal vein. Think of it like pinching off a garden hose. It leads to increased pressure upstream in the portal vein, which we call portal hypertension. And because of all this extra pressure, a huge amount of fluid can leak through the walls of the portal vein and into the abdominal cavity. That's what causes ascites to build up. As you can imagine, this can be really uncomfortable for someone, and it can also make it difficult for them to breathe as the fluid pushes up on the diaphragm. So I'll often do a procedure called a paracentesis. This is where I put a large needle into the abdominal cavity and drain out that excess fluid. Here's a video of me in residency right after I completed a paracentesis. All those jugs are filled with liters of fluid that I drained out of a patient's abdomen. And you can just imagine how much better that patient felt. But portal hypertension doesn't just cause fluid buildup in the abdomen. It also forces blood to find a new route back to the heart. Since the portal vein is under high pressure, blood is rerouted through small veins that aren't designed to handle this extra flow. Think of it like Google Maps rerouting you through narrow back alleys when there's a major traffic jam. One place this happens is around the belly button, where tiny veins in the abdominal wall expand and become visible under the skin. This creates a really striking pattern of swollen, twisting veins. We call this caput medusa named after the snake-covered head of Medusa from Greek mythology. And this same process can happen internally, particularly in the esophagus, where enlarged veins called varices can form. These esophageal varices are fragile, and they're prone to rupturing and bleeding. And people with liver disease have difficulty forming blood clots to stop that bleeding. This is what makes variceal bleeds one of the most dangerous, life-threatening complications of liver disease. And if you ask anyone who works in the emergency department, 
they'll have a terrifying story about this type of bleeding. This is palmar erythema. Notice how it affects the area over the thenar and hypothenar eminences and spares the center of the palm. This can be caused by liver disease, but it can also be seen in pregnancy. So what do these two things have in common? High estrogen levels. The liver is responsible for breaking down estrogen. And when it's not working properly, estrogen builds up in the body. One of the effects that estrogen has on the body is causing blood vessels to dilate or get wider. High estrogen levels can also cause little blood vessels in the skin to dilate so they look like this, sort of a spider-like shape, which is how they got their name, spider nevi. A really cool thing about spider nevi is that if you apply pressure to the skin, you can push the blood out of the vessels and they'll temporarily disappear. Now, having one or two of these can be perfectly normal. But if you have three or more spider nevi, then your estrogen levels are probably on the high side. And if you're not pregnant, it would make me start to wonder about liver disease. Liver disease also leads to muscle wasting, but this can sometimes be subtle and difficult to spot. A good place to check is the palm of the hand because the muscles are small and close to the surface. Another good place where I check for muscle wasting is around the temples. So why does this happen? Well, the liver is responsible for processing nutrients, making proteins and storing energy. But when it's damaged, the body starts breaking down muscle for fuel instead. There's one more thing to look at in the palm before we move on. See the puckering of the skin in this picture? And notice how this person's fingers are curled in and unable to fully extend? This is called Dupuytren's contracture. It's a condition where the fascia in the palm thickens and tightens over time, which leads to progressive finger contractures, especially in the fourth and fifth digits. There can be many causes, including a strong genetic link. It's actually quite common in people of Northern European descent, and it's how it got its nickname, Viking disease. So let's try a test together to check for Dupuytren's contracture. It's called the tabletop test, and all you do is lay your hand flat on a table table and see if your palm can touch. If it doesn't, it could be because one or more of your fingers is too tight from a contracture. Here's another really useful test that I use all the time in the hospital, and it's easy to do yourself. Hold your arms out straight while extending your wrists and fingers. For most of us, that's probably pretty easy, right? But in liver disease, patients can develop an involuntary flapping hand tremor called asterixis. Here's an example of this in a middle-aged woman with advanced liver disease. And the reason behind this flapping movement demonstrates an interesting link between the liver and the brain. As you know, the liver is responsible for clearing out toxins from our body. And not just toxins that we ingest, like alcohol, but also toxins that come about from normal cellular function. One of those toxins is ammonia, which is produced from the breakdown of protein. Normally, our liver can just clear that away. But if the liver is damaged, then ammonia levels build up and that affects the brain. This is called hepatic encephalopathy. And the reason this flapping tremor happens is that the brain can't sustain muscle contractions. So it's like the brain sort of forgets and then when it remembers, it starts contracting the muscles again, and that causes this flapping movement. But hepatic encephalopathy can be far more serious than just a tremor. I remember one time I was assessing a patient who had come into the emergency department after his friend had found him unresponsive. Fortunately, his vital signs were stable, his blood sugar was normal, and there were no other signs of critical illness. So I did a really hard sternal rub to try to cause a little bit of pain and wake him up, but still no response. During the examination, I couldn't help but notice a really distinct, musty, sweet smell on his breath. I recognized that smell instantly. It's called feeder hepaticus, which is Latin for foul odor of the liver. Basically, it's caused by toxins like dimethyl sulfide that build up in the blood and then get breathed out with carbon dioxide. So I ordered stat blood work, which showed a very high ammonia level. And it turned out that this patient hadn't had a bowel movement in three days. So what, this patient became so constipated that he became unresponsive? In a way, yes. You see, bacteria in our intestines break down proteins and produce ammonia, which then gets absorbed into our bloodstream. Unfortunately, without regular bowel movements, there was an overgrowth of ammonia producing bacteria in his colon. And because this patient had liver disease, he wasn't able to clear the ammonia from his body. So it built up and poisoned his brain. Fortunately, it's reversible. And interestingly, the treatment also has to do with the gut. We give a specific laxative called lactulose, which gets things moving, and it also converts ammonia into ammonium, which doesn't get absorbed into the bloodstream as easily. It's amazing to see how a laxative can clear somebody's mind 
and even have them wake up from an unresponsive state. Now, let's look at that video of Asterixis one more time. Do you notice how her skin looks a little bit yellow? This is called jaundice. Basically, your liver is responsible for processing and eliminating bilirubin, a yellow substance produced when red blood cells break down. But when the liver isn't working properly, bilirubin can build up in the blood. And if levels get high enough, it can be quite dramatic, even changing the color of your urine to a dark yellow or a brown tea color. And this isn't the only cause of tea colored urine. I made a whole video about what your urine says about your health. So I'll leave a link in the description in case you wanna watch that video next. Easy bruising or bleeding is also another concerning sign. Now, I'm sure we've all noticed a bruise once in a while and thought, where did that come from? But if that's happening a lot, or the bruises are really big and taking a long time to go away, that could be a sign of liver disease. Now, your body creates blood clots to stop bleeding. And to make a blood clot, you need clotting factors, and platelets. Clotting factors are proteins created by the liver, and in liver disease, those levels decrease. Platelets, on the other hand, are tiny blood cells that clump together to stop bleeding, and they're produced by the bone marrow. The liver comes into play because it makes a hormone called thrombopoietin, which tells the bone marrow to make platelets. And in liver disease, there's less of that hormone, so you end up with fewer platelets. And to make matters worse, the spleen is often enlarged in liver disease, and that can sequester platelets and take them out of circulation. Unfortunately, there's really no cure for liver disease, aside from getting a liver transplant. So prevention is key. I can do a whole video dedicated to this topic, but here it is in a nutshell. The top preventable causes of liver disease include alcohol, so minimize the amount that you're drinking, metabolic syndrome, which is linked to obesity and diabetes. This is probably the most common cause of liver disease that I see in the hospital these days. And the key to prevention is maintaining a healthy weight. And then there's chronic viral hepatitis. So that's hepatitis B and C. We have a vaccine against hep B, so I highly recommend you get that. And about 10 years ago, a cure for hep C was developed, which has been game changing. So hopefully that will no longer be a significant cause of liver disease in the future. If you enjoy learning about signs of disease that you can see for yourself, then check out this video next to find out what your hands say about your health. Stay curious, stay healthy, and I'll see you in the next video. So bye for now.